honestly, and I feel like I'm going to spend the entire review trying to explain this apparent contradiction, but this was simultaneously one of the worst live entertainments I have seen on a stage this year, and also perhaps one of the greatest nights of my life. Oh my god, hey, welcome back to my theatre-themed YouTube channel. My name is Mickey Joe, and I am obsessed with all things theatre. I am a content creator here on YouTube. I'm also a professional freelance theatre critic, sharing reviews of the many shows that I get to see, and I try and make sure that I am at all of the most notable shows happening in London, which of course meant I could not miss the one night only concert of Diana the Musical. The infamous musical adaptation of the story of the late Lady Diana Spencer, Princess of Wales. Now, if this is your first time hearing about this show, we have an awful lot to catch you up on. I'm going to let you know a little bit about the history of Diana the Musical, and then we're going to talk about this particular concert version. How were the performances? Was the concert itself well produced? And most interestingly, what was the reaction like of a British audience seeing Diana the Musical appearing in the UK for the very first time. The answer may or may not surprise you. Fun fact, I bought the tickets to see this concert while I was in New York because some of my American friends were planning flights to come to the UK to see it. And sure, the royal family has always been something of a draw for international tourism, but never quite like this. Now, if you enjoyed today's video, make sure to subscribe to my theatre-themed YouTube channel for many more theatre reviews, as well as lots more theatre-related content. Also, you can go and find me on other social media platforms. I'm at Mickey Joe Theatre on Instagram, on TikTok, on the app formerly known as Twitter. And most importantly, if you were at Diana the Musical in concert last night at the Eventim Apollo, comment down below with any and all of your thoughts. Because let me tell you, if you were a part of that audience, not only will you have bragging rights for years to come that you were there when it happened, happened, but also we are now all trauma bonded by that shared experience and I feel a lot closer to all of you for it. And if you weren't there, you're about to find out exactly what I'm talking about. Let's discuss Diana the Musical in concert. So Diana the Musical was one of the many Broadway shows whose planned trajectory was impacted by the COVID-19 pandemic and Broadway shutdown. It of course tells the story of Lady Diana Spencer, later the Princess of Wales, who was the first wife of current reigning British monarch King Charles III. Charlie to his friends. Perhaps, I, I really don't know. And because the show was ultimately unable to open on Broadway in 2020, instead they did something quite pioneering, which was to film a full professional recording of the show and release it on Netflix prior to their eventual delayed Broadway opening. This certainly skyrocketed the show to mainstream recognition. It also earned it a certain amount of infamy and notoriety worldwide. It became perhaps the first pro shot musical recording to be nominated for a bunch of Razzies. Those are awards celebrating awful performances captured on film and awful films, which I do think were undeserved in this instance, but were also received largely as a badge of honor. In any case, audiences were shocked by the more tongue-in-cheek, camp, and downright bizarre moments of the show. Obviously being performed by a largely American cast, there was a little bit of inconsistency when it came to British accents. There were also such memorable lyrics as better than a Guinness, better than a and of course the you dress. And honestly, dozens more. Harry, my ginger head son. So it came as little surprise when the show eventually opened on Broadway, was slated by the critics and subsequently closed, but it did develop something of a small cult following during its short-lived time on the Great White Way. And we can talk about whether or not the Netflix filming was a good idea and whether it really captures an accurate version of the show without an audience in that theater because it was filmed during the pandemic. But were it not for that Netflix version, it seems a little less likely that this would be happening in the first place. Because as Diana grew in prominence, people began to ask the question, could this ever be produced in London? Should this ever be produced in London? And would it be? A question which was answered when this was announced, Diana the Musical in concert at the Eventim Apollo, which interestingly enough is not a West End theater. It has housed musicals before the current UK 
tour of Shrek will be playing there next summer. Last summer it was the home of the revival of Sister Act, it's where I saw Ben Platt in concert, because it is largely a concert venue. It's a three and a half thousand seater massive auditorium. Not strictly speaking an ideal venue for musical theatre, but attractive to producers because of its large scale and its capacity to sell a great many tickets. But that, I suspect, is not the only factor in terms of how Diana came to find itself at this venue. Because when people were speculating about the possibility of Diana the Musical having a life in London, there were certain theatres where immediately you knew it was not going to be a possibility, such as The Prince of Wales, as Charles was titled during their marriage, also the newly renamed His Majesty's Theatre, the Palace Theatre, the Other Palace, the Victoria Palace, and those are just the most on-the-nose references. You also have a handful of royal adjacent theatres like Theatre Royal Haymarket, Theatre Royal Drury Lane, the Prince Edward, the Duchess, the Duke of York's. Honestly, there are many. But this is also indicative of an issue which goes beyond just the names of these theatres, which is the Society of London Theatre itself, which is connected to all of these West End venues and has inherently royal attachment and royal patronage. Which is to say that everything within the West End theatre sphere is very closely connected to royalty and to the monarchy. Now, I don't think that the monarchy specifically said you may not do Diana in any West End theatres. It's more I don't think any producer has been brave enough thus far to actually ask. And yet it's possible they floated the idea and someone from the palace literally shut it down. That wouldn't surprise me, I've, I've seen the crown. Which incidentally is what you should all go and do for yourselves if you want any more info on the synopsis of this show because it's time for us to talk about the concert itself and what it was actually like. So you want to know what I thought of this show, and I will preface this by telling you my feelings about Diana the Musical, because I was just as shocked as you may have been when I first listened to it, when I first watched the thing on Netflix, and I was like, this quite clearly doesn't fully know what it wants to be, because it is stuck somewhere between this sincere depiction of her life and a fun, campy, silly sort of a parody. This was exemplified, I think, by Judy Kay in the original production playing both the queen and attempting an awful lot of sincerity and gravitas and doing a wonderful job, I will say, she's Judy Kay. And also playing romance novelist Barbara Cartland, who, while a legitimate relative of Diana's, arrives sort of inexplicably in the show, reappears to narrate Diana's introduction to her lover James Hewitt at the start of the second act with a bit of very racy imagined dialogue that again is really fun and delicious and silly and naughty but when you have these other works that strive for realism and honesty and integrity to have this musical which is already challenged because you know audiences I think are inherently critical of when real characters based on real people start singing. And wrongfully so, because musicals can be both sincere and serious. But, I mean, in the first act, as an example, when Diana starts singing in Spanish to King Prince Charles in order to try and impart her love to him, it does begin to lose me just a little bit. And yet it wins me over in a different way, because I am not here today to tell you that I hate this show. In fact, I have a great time unironically listening to this cast recording repeatedly. No, it isn't a great show. No, I don't think it was robbed of the Tony or the Pulitzer Prize for drama. This is an objectively deeply flawed piece of theater that like so many shows I've been talking about recently, finds itself stuck between two different goals and doesn't know what to make of itself. It is, however, full guilty pleasure territory. This lives in the same part of my brain as Jekyll and Hyde and honestly, kind of the Phantom of the Opera. All of those shows have their own legitimate merits. They all have this slight creeping camp element, some more so than others, but I enjoy listening to them all repeatedly and not because I honestly think that they are works of genius. So like I mentioned at the start of this video, this evening at the theater, was one of, maybe one of the best nights of my life. I had a great time. I had a fantastic time seeing Diana the Musical in concert last night. It was so fun, and the show was received in this raucous and joyous and incredulous fashion. I will talk more about the audience response later on because it's worth talking about, but I legitimately enjoyed myself. That being said, this 
really was a disaster on just about every front. In terms of how staged this was, I'm going to talk about the actual direction and choreography later on. We didn't really get costuming. We got uh, some references to some of Diana's iconic casual looks with like a couple of different sweaters that she wore. We did get a revenge dress moment. We also got a change into one like form fitting black dress during the song Pretty Pretty Girl. But the costuming was so limited throughout the show. Camilla had one suit outfit that I suspect was probably a suit Alice Fern actually owns herself. Andy Coxon similarly, I think was just wearing his own suit as Charles. Denise Welch had quite a good queen get up. She had a wig and everything, but the bar was set so low for costuming. Like there was no attempt for anyone's hair to look like Diana's that just Carrie Ellis coming out in a little black dress during Pretty Pretty Girl, the song which on Broadway had like 10 different gorgeous dress reveals happening instantly on stage. That merited huge applause because we were being given crumbs basically. The same for the dress reveal in the song, The Dress, which I went as mad as anyone else because I genuinely thought we weren't going to get it. And then they brought Mayor Quanta Breed out in a recreation of the Black Revenge dress. Somehow, and even though it's not included on the song list, Secrets and Lies, the scene in which Diana visits AIDS patients, again, based on real events, uh, that somehow, did make it in to the show uh, almost entirely unaltered. And while I do think that a lot of the show's sillier moments are just harmless fun, a lot of the lines in this song I find legitimately offensive because you're portraying these gay men at the center of this dreadful epidemic who sing these like sassy, campy lines to her. He agrees to take a photograph with her because, and I quote, he's handsome as hell, so they'd probably get good reviews. He also says, you may think me mad, but the lighting's not bad. It's just so vapid and so shallow and such an important scene that ought to be handled with so much more delicacy and care. It's, it's offensive. It's completely offensive. As she's leaving, the AIDS patient sings to her, well, you always did like sexy young blokes. Honestly, I think it's a miracle that the sound quality was so poor that people couldn't necessarily discern all of these lyrics because I think there ought to have been uproar. So I've spoken briefly about the material. Before I circle back, to talk about the performances and the changes that have been made to Diana for this latest version of the show, I want to convey to you what this concert itself was actually like. Okay, we have a great many producers now in the UK who are kind of dedicatedly and annually producing really solid concert versions of shows. A lot of the concerts being produced by Lambert Jackson, I find myself being consistently disappointed on the producing front. I find they are often in venues which are completely inappropriate to the scale of the show, as well as the tone of the show itself, which results in some pretty dreadful sound quality. All of which is to say that the fact this was a concert production is not an excuse for delivering a subpar evening of entertainment, especially when you consider how many tickets were sold, the prices at which the tickets were sold, and the reality that other people are consistently doing this better. When you think back to Super You in concert at the Lyric, Babies in concert at the Lyric, my god, Death Note, some amazing concert productions we've seen in the West End this year. This one doesn't just pale in comparison, it's a little embarrassing. Because it wasn't simply that the sound quality was bad. The sound cues were so poorly picked up that we had several moments throughout the show where there was just silence because people weren't properly mic'd. Perhaps even more egregious were the lighting issues. Because from the beginning of the show, we had the entrance of Lady Diana Spencer, who during her first lines of the show was not properly lit, was not really at all lit. She was kind of silhouetted in darkness. This happened constantly. There were so many moments where characters were not properly lit. I would say for the majority of the show, no one was really exceptionally lit. It was largely passable, but plenty was said and sung in near total darkness. Right at the end of the show, there was a laughable lighting cue in which they cut to the final lighting state and Diana is silhouetted with this dramatic lighting before she's finished singing her song. So they had to go back to the previous lighting state and then do it again. Really the only word for it is amateurish. And you might expect me to lay this at the feet of the tech team and the sound and lighting operatives, and I'm not going to do that. Let me tell you why. 
because I later learned and honestly didn't need the confirmation because it was exceptionally apparent for many reasons during the show that there was a minimal rehearsal process to put all of this together. Things like sufficient technical rehearsal and a dress rehearsal or appropriate time for the chorus to learn the material. These were just not factored into the show's production budget, it seems. And I can't tell you why this is. I don't know whether there was a series of bad luck involved or the more likely explanation that they simply didn't want to pay for any additional rehearsal rehearsal time. In any case, this thing was thrown together and it showed. Amateurish, all round. Amateurish isn't even the appropriate word because that is disparaging towards amateur and community theatre groups who spend an awful lot of time on their technical and dress rehearsals to make sure that the audience who are paying considerably lower ticket prices to come and see their shows are getting something of at least rehearsed quality. I'm quite annoyed about this, if you couldn't tell. Because we talk a lot about inflated ticket prices, we talk a lot about enduring a cost of living crisis, the amount that these people are spending on tickets, and you do not have the basic respect for your audience to even rehearse the damn thing properly so that it looks at the very least professional. Let alone good, just professional. Like, before I can even begin to talk about the quality of the actual performances and material itself, we need to be able to see and to hear them. But another symptom of this visibly slapdash rehearsal process was the staging itself. So this concert was directed by Owen Horsley, who according to his bio here has extensive Shakespearean experience and has perhaps directed not one musical before in his life. Which is why the choreographer joining him on this creative team was, oh yes, that's right, there wasn't one. The result of which I am genuinely sorry to say was one of the most shambolic stagings of a musical I have seen in recent memory. For the most part, there was no choreography in the sections where the material really explicitly calls for some, such as during the more rocky interludes of the song, This Is How Your People Dance, when Diana is attending an evening of refined classical music on an early date with Prince Charles, and she dreams about being somewhere more exciting. What happened here is Mayor Kwanzaa Breed stood on a chair and a, a little line from the ensemble sort of congered their way onto the central area of the stage and just jumped up and down in a circle around her. This was repeated because it worked so well the first time. There's another moment later on during the song she moves in the most modern ways, which is a clever duality to talk about how she conducts her Herself in public, as well as a historical moment where she actually appeared dancing unexpectedly as a surprise for Charles, who <laughs> shockingly did not take it well whatsoever, at a sort of a royal ballet gala performance. In the original Broadway production, Diana suddenly appeared dancing on stage during the climax of the song as it documented the audience's reactions to this moment. But in the concert version, not only is Diana nowhere to be seen during this sequence, they make up for not wanting to stage a minimal moment of dance by instead having the ensemble messily cross, nearly crash into each other in order to walk to a bunch of chairs and sit and just become the audience so that what we're watching is not the dance itself but like eight people sat in chairs talking about it. Which looked about as thrilling as it sounds. There are also some numbers in the show which have such a great groove or accelerated pulse that they do call for movement even though they're not specifically about dance, such as the song The Dress. I'm going to talk more about how this song has been changed when I talk about differences in this version of the show. But there was a piece of choreography here where we had four or five ensemble members who formed a line and started to do a cannon step click, at which point I was seamlessly transported to like first year university musical theatre society and like society showcase rehearsal and not even the choreography that would have been kept in. Like this would have been thrown out as simply too amateurish looking to even make it into a first year University Musical Theatre Society showcase. Like you may think I'm overreacting to this, but professional musical theatre concert right here, an actual cannon step click, that actually happened. There was a moment where they had a cannon arm movement, first one simply didn't do it, and it was at these moments that you could really discern the lack of rehearsal time. That was painfully apparent, keyword being painful. And it's not as though the ensemble were just neglected in favour of the leads, because the leads didn't show any indication of really having been directed other than walking to a spot and singing about their royal feelings. Like, I honestly could not tell you what this experienced Shakespearean director had really done to this show other than basically conducting a small amount of traffic. So let me tell you about some of the changes to the material. For those of you already familiar with Diana the Musical, I don't believe any songs were cut in their entirety. There were an awful lot of interludes in things like Pretty Pretty Girl and The Dress, 
where the queen's sections were removed entirely and the queen had an awful lot less. One of the biggest cuts to material was in Him and Her, which is still called Him and Her, but they now don't sing any of that section with the now there's him and her and him and her all gone, which is a shame because I really enjoyed that. And it gives you a lot of valuable insights into the relationship between Charles and Camilla and uh, Diana and James Hewitt. I do want to mention, in terms of Charles and Camilla, the show does try and do a very honourable thing by them. It doesn't just frame them simply as villains. You certainly have the opportunity to see them in that light because of it being Diana's story and her being so young and naive and impressionable at the beginning and so evidently taken advantage of. But as well as the cut section from him and her, the show gives plenty of opportunities to these characters to articulate their feelings about each other, Charles and Camilla this is, with an awful lot of honesty. But we lose a lot of James Hewitt material, we lose a lot of the Queen's material. The second act was only 35 minutes long. A lot of the book scenes were really condensed. I don't know if that was just because this was a concert version of the show and they just wanted to focus more on the music. The biggest change to the show was the fact that we had two different Dianas. We had Maya Kwanzaa Breed playing Diana Spencer and we had Carrie Ellis playing Diana Princess of Wales, which made a lot more sense in the first act because we had Maya actually doing all of the scenes and Kerry singing sort of from an older Diana's perspective, which I think works very well for this show. The whole show feels like it's being shown from Diana's perspective in her memory, so for her to be the narrator of the whole thing works on multiple levels. It also means that during those early scenes where we know Diana is being set up and we know she's being taken advantage of and she's not being told the full story about this sort of life of challenging compromise that she's about to marry into that seems to be a lot more grand and special than it will actually turn out to be, rather than feeling this frustration as an audience because it isn't until much later that Diana sort of finds her strength, we get our own feelings echoed on stage by the elder Diana character who sings that perspective. The best use of this was in The Worst Job in England, because before you had the Queen singing about all of the wonderful things that Diana would get, and you the ensemble echoing all of the harsh realities of becoming Princess of Wales. But this time around, they swapped it and they gave those lines to Diana, a Diana that had lived that experience and knew all about it. So it was much more loaded, it meant something. Previously, there wasn't really much of a reason for the ensemble to be the people singing these lines because the ensemble don't really have a character at this point. It also carries a lot more weight when it's someone sort of from the future of those events looking back on it saying that this would actually go on to happen with certainty. The two Dianas shared I will between them. The way that those lyrics were allocated made a lot of sense. That was quite well balanced. The one I wasn't as convinced about was The World Fell In Love, because there was a section that used to be sung by Charles when he was like, I was crowned in this country, how that day lives in me. And he talks about his sort of early frustrations in the marriage, about how Diana is received a lot more warmly by the British public than he is. In this version, they give those lines to older Diana, and she's singing about how she was much more popular at that point than Charles was. But it means in the next scene, he's sort of inexplicably cross, we haven't seen why, and so when young Diana says, are you still angry with me? Uh, it means older Diana then has to look at the audience and say, because of the press coverage, or something to that effect. It's a very heavy-handed line that we wouldn't even need if we had just let him express his feelings in the number before and not taken those lines away from him. They had also cut the line, uh, Harry my gingerhead son. There is no reference to the birth of Harry, she just suddenly has two children at one point. Harry my gingerhead son was actually cut before it got to Broadway because I guess they realised if they couldn't call him a gingerhead baby, they just didn't know how to refer to him at all. Now there were two lines that seemed to be added in specifically for this production. The first was in the first act during This Is How Your People Dance, when Diana makes a spoken reference to how she would later go on to visit the Royal Vauxhall Tavern, historic gay bar in London, uh, where she was accompanied by Freddie Mercury of Queen. He was already referenced in the lyrics to this song, so it's a nice place for that to be. But again, within the world of musical theatre convention, we talk about showing and not telling, and much more interesting than just hearing about that in a throwaway bit of dialogue would have been actually staging that. The dialogue leading into I Miss You Most on Sundays is different and not nearly as effective, because before uh, Camilla used to say something like, don't you think I miss you as well? And it came out of this like slight argument and then she would sing I miss you most on Sundays. And this time around, I can't remember exactly 
what was changed, but it wasn't nearly as good because he was the one trying to appeal to her and she was shutting him down and she was like, no, 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 we mustn't miss each other, but I miss you most on Sundays. It just didn't work. It didn't flow out of her in the same organic way. The other line that was added for this production that I mentioned earlier came right before Diana visited the AIDS patients uh, when she says it's important for her to go because of like, especially after everything that Margaret Thatcher has done, that got a big response as expected with the UK audience. A couple other changes. I am convinced that some of Diana's sister Sarah's material was changed because a lot of her lines, it's no fault of the actress playing her, they're just so dismissive in these scenes of real emotional challenge for Diana when she's having a crisis of confidence on the morning of her wedding and saying, I'm not sure he really loves me. What should I do about it? Her sister leaves on this line being like, well, it's too late now and walks off. That got a huge laugh because it was just so unhelpful from this person who's meant to be her support and confidant. Similarly, she has a line in a later scene after there have been documented suicide attempts where she says, to her sister, who is like recovering from all of this and recovering from postpartum depression, saying, if you ask me, you're just doing all of this to get your husband's attention. Something, again, very dismissive, very uncharacteristic of the, of the way that she's been presented. Finally, a big change at the end of the show is that they don't do the lines about Diana's actual death that normally come uh, towards the end of the song, If. So in this version of the show, Diana simply does not die at the end. And I guess, certainly in the UK, it is known at least what would go on to happen afterwards. So arguably you don't have to put that in the show, but it does feel a little bit unusual. It feels like a thing that we're all waiting for, that moment of just like confirmation that that is the end of the show. And it becomes this sort of like awareness that that is impending and then it never happens. So unusual. The very end of the show used to be a couple of lines like the people that will change the world are not the ones you think will change the world, which Charles had the audacity to sing in the Netflix version. I have it on good authority that this was reallocated. He didn't, he wasn't the one to sing it, I believe when it opened on Broadway, but that uh, was just gone entirely from the concert. So Maya Kwanzaa Breed and Kerry Ellis as the two Dianas then. I enjoyed Kerry Ellis very much as older Diana. She sounded fantastic. First of all, Kerry Ellis, who if you don't know, uh, was the first British actress to play Elphaba in the West End. She also played Elphaba on Broadway and she sounded phenomenal. I think some of this Diana material has never actually been sung better than when Kerry did it last night. I also enjoyed her characterization of act two Diana. I said the split between them worked well in act one. In the second act, after Kerry has seemingly taken over as the principal Diana and isn't just like ghost Diana in the first act lingering and sharing her sassy thoughts on things. It's weird for Maya to then come back because you're not sure who Maya is meant to represent at that point. When Kerry is then older Diana, what is Maya doing? Is Maya meant to be young Diana looking forwards with sadness of what her life might become? I don't know because she actually shares scenes with Charles. So the way that they use them in the second act very odd. Maya's characterization I enjoyed more than her singing. Her Diana speaking voice had me really convinced at the beginning. It started to get just a little bit too breathy as we went on and her vocal placement for the whole thing better in some songs than others but often just found itself in a little bit of a weird place where it's a little too much just like raised soft palate and I wanted a little bit more strength to come through. It was a little too head heavy a mix for me. I will say though that of the principal performers, Mayor I believe is the only one who was also doing a show this week. Like she just closed Lizzie at Southwark Playhouse, which is a big belty rock show. So that's a lot for her to have contended with in the last few days. Andy Coxon did a decent job as Charles just kind of stropping about the place. He sounded great. He sounded really not unlike Ro Hartramp who played the role in the Netflix version and the original Broadway cast. Andy being British obviously had a slightly better grasp on the British accent. But what I didn't think we really got were those moments where he was really trying with Diana, when he was really attempting to recommit to his marriage. There was sort of a blink and you'll miss it instance of like, no, I'm really going to make a go of this before immediately answering a telephone. It was almost comical how quickly the telephone call came from uh, Camilla. He was literally like, I'm recommitting to you, my wife. And then someone's like, telephone call, sir. Do you want to recommence your affair? And he's like, well, go on then. Which brings us to Alice Fern as Camilla Parker Bowles, which honestly, 
perfectly pitched, absolutely perfect. And I could not have come up with this casting and did not realize how excellent it would be, but she fits this just so well. So props to the genius who came up with this piece of casting. She sounds obviously sensational, another ex-UK alphaba. And she arrived at this concert performance with the understanding that she was there to give the gays everything they wanted. So having been booed in her entrance as Camilla Parker Bowles, she did a lot for royal approval ratings, I think, when she added an option up in I Miss You Most on Sundays and added this thrilling high note in the middle of a glorious vocal performance that had everyone cheering for Camilla. But the dialogue, fantastic, wonderfully bitchy, the scenes with Charles, her performance of that song, I Miss You Most on Sundays, the thriller in Camilla with Diana and Camilla in the second act in the song, the main event, Kerry and Alice going at each other. I wanted that scene to be like five times as long because I did not want it to end. They were both fantastic. Then we get to Denise Welsh as the Queen. Now, Denise is usually seen as a panelist on the TV chat show Loose Women. For any Americans watching this, it's kind of like our version of The View, so it's a little bit like if Joy Behar was to go into musical theatre. And Denise does have a background in acting and a little bit of a background in singing, perhaps. Another big change for this version, Barbara Cartland gone completely. She is not mentioned in the first act, she does not appear in the second. Instead, older narrator Diana, who at this point is just also being Diana because we're at the beginning of the second act, she sings the lines about James Hewitt, which, you know, good for her. The dialogue with James Hewitt is also cut short. They, like he says, I often for riding lessons, but she doesn't do the whole like, my husband can't give me riding lessons, he's tried, but he's not very good, because that's all like stuff that Barbara Cartland then acknowledges she's made up. So they just don't do that dialogue, they just carry on with the song. It's a shame because the book scene in which Barbara is mentioned in the first act is when we first learn that Diana's parents are divorced, which is such a huge motivator for her that she sings about repeatedly as the show continues. We really do need to learn that early on because otherwise you question why she keeps trying to stay with Charles and it's because she doesn't want her sons to be children of divorce. We need to learn how important that is to her earlier on. Now, I liked the characterization. She was giving you like stern Queen Elizabeth II. I did miss the tentative kind of frosty common ground that the Queen and Diana found in the Broadway version of the show at the end, because it seemed like even after Denise sang an officer's wife, uh, that her version of the Queen still really wasn't receptive to hearing anything Diana had to say or admitting any fault within the palace and their approach to the handling of this whole situation. But a much bigger issue than the characterization was the singing because she made the noble choice to not really sing the whole thing. Most of the Queen's singing in songs other than Whatever Love Means Anyway and An Officer's Wife was cut, so she had much less singing to do than Judy Kay had in the Broadway version, but she didn't really sing it. She just kind of Rex Harrison spoke sung her way through the whole thing. There was the occasional line where she would literally just deliver it as a spoken line rather than even trying to sing it, but it was this kind of like pitched dialogue rather than song. It did not sound good. And it does seem like a shame because, you know, having Denise Welsh in this role is a camp old casting idea. It's basically pantomime adjacent, but you can't help but feel like the Barbara Cartland material would have been so much more fun to see her do. And if she's just going to play this austere version of the Queen and have to sing these kind of like older soprano moments, then could we not have had like a Claire Moore doing that or any of the many veteran stage performers who would have done a wonderful job? Jay Perry did a great job vocally as James Hewitt. He was barely in the thing because they cut the majority of his material. He turned up, he stood in a box, he sang very high and then he left. Finally, the last thing I need to tell you about is this audience reaction, because this was wild. I shared on social media last night that being a part of this audience uh, perhaps was what the storming of the Bastille felt like. And then I woke up this morning to see a lot of people talking about how this raucous and rowdy audience had spoiled the experience for them. And people were thinking that this was another like what had recently happened at Hamilton or what happened earlier in the year at Jersey Boys, where disruptive audience members ruined the show. And I need to share with you that that is not what this was, at least from my perspective. Most of the enthusiasm seemed to be coming from higher up in the circle. I was towards the front of the circle, but certainly every time that Charles and Camilla 
were on stage, they were met with boos. It wasn't booing over their dialogue, like they could still speak and sing. It was just like when Camilla is first introduced, like this is Camilla Parker Bowles, there was a boo and there were literal snake noises happening. Like whenever they would do something objectively unkind towards Diana, it was met with a vocal audience response. But again, it wasn't an overwhelming one. It was not disruptive to the performance. It just felt like a very engaged audience, which honestly I kind of loved. If anyone was curious about what would happen when you try to bring Diana the Musical to London, I feel like this was always a little bit of an inevitability. I did turn to my American friend and said instantly as soon as the booing started that like bringing this to the UK was just a mistake. Like, I think this is always going to happen because people have strong feelings, not only where the monarchy is concerned, but especially where Diana and the monarchy are concerned. Like, there has always been a divide in the country about people's feelings about whether or not there ought to be a monarchy. But certainly, when Diana was around and around her death, that really made the biggest impact to people's feelings towards the royal family. And so seeing those historical scenes unfold will always elicit a strong emotional response in people. But it wasn't just the Charles and Camilla stuff. There were lots of moments of laughter at lines of dialogue that are absolutely not meant to be funny because it was incredulous laughter. There was laughter at the sound issues and the lighting issues. There was a big old cheer for the line serves me right for marrying a Scorpio. But with all of this, it does feel as though Diana the Musical is not approaching any where it's going to be taken seriously by audiences. What it can do is provide a very fun night at the theatre and it seems destined to become something like a Rocky Horror Show where the audience can be engaged and they can boo Charles and Camilla. And if it were to lean more into the campsite, bring back Barbara Cartland, put back in the line about the ginger baby, dear God, change the scene with the AIDS patients because that is simply offensive. But let this be a campy show with a beloved cult audience and I think it might actually be quite successful. Not on Broadway and not in the West End, but there are places where this show could have a life. At the Edinburgh Fringe with a Prosecco in hand, audiences would love this. But that basically brings my thoughts about Diana the Musical in concert to an end. This was probably a very long review because there was an awful lot to say about this, but I am also just as intrigued to hear all of your thoughts. So if you got to see this in concert last night at the event in Apollo, comment down below. What did you think of it? Did you unironically enjoy it? Did you agree with me? Did you disagree with me? Let us know in the comments section down below. Thank you so much for watching this review. I hope that you have enjoyed. If you did, make sure to subscribe to my theatre themed YouTube channel for many more reviews coming very soon about all of your favourite shows. I hope that everyone is staying safe and that you have a stagey day. For 10 more seconds, I'm Mickey Joe Theatre. Oh my god, hey, thanks for watching, have a stagey day. Subscribe! <laughs>